дорогие друзья, один, один, один. Dear friends. Can you hear me all right? Should be fine. We're settling in. Good friends. Our honorable delegates would like to announce the eighth science conference anti-monopoly policy practice education and science open as tradition goes we uh, held conferences in the end of autumn beginning of winter in this innovation center of Skolkova. in the beginning of this conference i'd like to extend my gratitude to igor drozdov for the opportunity to be able to discuss um, the anti-monopoly issues in uh, such uh, comfortable conditions. Regulations, practices, these are the topics we will be discussing. Um, we are doing so preempting the um, three decades we'll be celebrating since the birth of the Constitution of Russia. That's why our major topic will be constitutional foundations of anti-monopoly politics in Russia and abroad. But remind you that uh, 1993, that's when the Constitution was adopted by the general census, by the general referendum, which is the highest way of uh, expressing uh, people's will. And since then, the basics of the Constitution the core of it remained unchanged, including some of the stipulations that guarantee single economic space within Russia, the freedom of economic activities, the um, prevalence of the rights for personal property and uh, anti-monopoly and competition support. Unfortunately, the uh, judges of the Constitutional Court were not able to attend the meeting. We send our invitations, but they forwarded to the chairperson of our conference um, all their wishes to the success of this event and the importance of the topic we've chosen. And now I'd like to give the first floor for the speech, the head of the anti-monopoly service of Rasta, Maxim Shaskorsky. Please, the floor is now yours. Does this mic work? It seems like it does. Dear colleagues, I am very happy to welcome you to the 8th International Scientific and Practical Conference Anti-Monopoly Policy Science Practice Education. Within the walls of the Skolkova Institute of Science and Technology, a unique place of concentration of innovative activities and intellectual resources. The venue of the meeting has not been chosen by chance. In recent years, scientists and practitioners have been paying close attention to finding new approaches to maintaining a competitive environment in commodity markets in the context of digital economic growth and an advancement of technological potential of Russia, protecting private and public interests in the field of intellectual property. In this regard, of significance is the discussion of issues on the role and place of competition protection from the standpoint of constitutional principles. And therefore, our conference was planned on the eve of the 30th anniversary of the Constitution of the Russian Federation. It is known the Constitution of the Russian Federation, adopted 30 years ago for the first time in our history, fixed the protection of competition as the basis of the constitutional system. The principles of competition are directly reflected not only in the Constitution of the Russian Federation, but also in a civil legislation, the law and protection of competition. The provisions of the Constitution stipulating guarantees in economic activities serve as an efficient guideline for all participants in legal relations, including our legislators, law enforcement, and anti-monopoly regulators. Part 1, Article 8 of the Constitution guarantees the unity of the economic space, movement, free movement of goods, services, and financial resources, freedom of economic activity. This guarantee is also reflected in the law and protection of competition, the provisions of which are aimed at creating conditions for effective functioning of commodity markets. 
Article 34 of the Constitution explicitly prohibits economic activities that are aimed at monopolization and unfair competition, the competition not in good faith. The inclusion of competition provisions in the norms of the Constitution demonstrates that the protection of competition is of utmost importance for the state, and it becomes a constitutionally significant objective. Let me mark that similar principles can be traced in constitutions of many other foreign jurisdictions, including India, China, Mongolia, Indonesia, as well as CIS member states such as Armenia and Kazakhstan. The development of market economy is characterized by an enhanced complication and enlargement of number of economic ties and business entities, which requires legislative regulation in the anti-monopoly sphere. In Russia, we constantly perfect our legal frameworks that regulate economic relations. In this regard, dear colleagues, I would like to outline some of the relevant areas within the framework of improving our legislation in this sphere. First of all, let me start with some of the measures that had already been implemented in Russia, one of which is the introduction of a mechanism of compulsory licensing in the Russian Civil Code, which made it possible to limit the exclusive rights of patent holders in cases there's a life and death issue and we need to protect human life and health. In particular, this mechanism helped us during the fight against the pandemic to ensure a necessary amount of remdesivir, an antiviral drug, as well as to prevent artificial price inflation during this period of time and saturate the domestic market with it. An effective mechanism for ensuring public interest is the development of parallel imports. As you know, on a temporary basis, there's been a set of legal norms introduced in Russia that allow to import goods of foreign copyright holders into the territory of Russia without their consent. In terms of the competition, parallel imports are important as a mechanism for reducing the level of power of the copyright holder. It helps to saturate the market, reduce the prices or restrain them, creating new jobs and opportunities for SMEs. The parallel import mechanism and its exclusion for unfair purposes, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service of Russia and the Association of Corporate Lawyers developed and adopted good practices on uh, dealing with marketplaces and copyright holders against the sale of non-original products which uh, um, appeared at marketplaces. In a short period of time, this mechanism has shown its efficiency, had a positive impact on competition in the domestic market, and in our opinion, has a good potential for growing further in the legal system of Russia. Of greater significance are the issues of protecting public interests uh, within the against the backdrop of e-commerce and uh, digital economy growing. One of the priority tasks for the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service of Russia is to protect the interests in consumers and bona fide participants in digital markets from the abuse by digital monopolies whose activities are based on the use of IP uh, specifically. In September 2023, the so-called fifth anti-monopoly package um, was put forward, including two laws amending the law on protection of competition in the Code of Administrative Offenses. The amendments made are aimed at improving the anti-monopoly regulation of digital markets, including preventing the abuse of dominant position, state control and oversight over economic concentration and suppression of anti-competitive agreements. The uh, law on protection of competition introduces new concepts, network effect and digital platform. Network effects can serve as a serious obstacle uh, from um, letting uh, businesses entering the market, since one of the conditions for this achievement is a certain level of demand and the number of consumers compatible to the network effect achieved by a competitor. Now, the law on protection of competition defines a set of conditions under which the owner of a digital platform will be considered a dominant player. The uh, presence of a network effect, a share of transaction over 35% and the revenue over 2 billion rubles. Also, in terms of control over economic concentration, the law and protection of competition introduces the new basis, according to which transactions with shares of commercial organizations must be made with prior consent of the anti-monopoly authority in excess of 7 billion rubles. This innovation will allow to take into account the true value 
the true estimate of the company since traditional criteria based on the amount of revenue of the transaction participants or the value of their assets might not always reflect the real impact on the transaction and its cascading effect on the market competition position. In addition, uh, the parties to the transaction can uh, declare voluntary obligations to ensure competition in the market. It becomes possible to attract experts for such economic concentration transactions as well as we can monitor the execution of such regulations. All these changes, in our opinion, have made it possible to enrich the anti-monopoly legislation with effective tools for protecting consumers and SMEs. At the same time, there are still issues today that require our uh, permanent attention. For example, ensuring effective anti-monopoly oversight in the field of IP, intellectual property, uh, intellectual activities, the results of intellectual activity form new commodity markets and sectors of the economy. They contribute to technological progress and strengthen the technological sovereignty of Russia. At the same time, the usage of IP products are complicated with the risks of monopolization and it might lead to a restriction in competition. It is obvious that persons who have exclusive rights to IP, uh, IP objects should not abuse them to the detriment of other market participants or restrict competition. The practice of anti-monopoly bodies indicate an increased proportion of complaints. The IP rights owners use IP rights protection mechanisms in order to monopolize the commodity markets, including digital ones. It often happens because the immunities provided in Part 4, Article 10, and Part 9, Article 11 of the Law and Protection of Competition completely um, take out the actions of such entities out of the spotlight of the anti-monopoly control. For example, uh, we have cases uh, by Apple, Google, Microsoft, Booking, Headhunter, and uh, etc. Almost every company stated arguments about the inadmissibility of FAS in connection with the effect of anti-monopoly immunities. But the courts rejected their arguments. It should be noted that this issue was subject of consideration by the Constitutional Court, which in its 2018 resolution number 8 slash P unequivocally expressed the position that the copyright holder is obliged to comply with the general legal principles of their exercise of rights, in particular inadmissibility of abuse this approach is based on the Constitution of Russia, which guarantees on one hand IP rights, but on the other hand, it bans any economic activities that are aimed at monopolizing or not bona fide competition. Anti-monopoly immunity often are being used not for additional protection of IP, but for the purpose of restricting competition. After conducting an analysis of anti-monopoly legislation of foreign countries, we uh, saw the absence of anti-monopoly immunities in the field of IP. In our opinion, in Russia, we also should uh, prevent acts of monopolistic activity that uh, use the results of IP, excluding anti-monopoly immunities. And to this date, the issue has already been considered, and we are looking at it. I would also like to note that uh, in spring this year, the Constitutional Court of Russian Federation adopted two fundamentally important decisions that for a long time had uh, no unambiguous resolution in uh, legislative practice. First is the inadmissibility of expanding interpretation of legislative immunities for cartels. The state is not obliged to grant any group of persons immunity from liability for entering to anti-competitive agreements, including cartels at auctions. At the same time, the Constitutional Court pointed to the possibility of the legislature to limit the effect of such immunities in respect to, of individual violations, in particular at auctions. The second decision of the Constitutional Court is on the procedure of calculating the amount of criminal revenues or income. It is determined based on the proceeds received by a person for the entire time of their activities without deducting the expense of this person for its implementation. The conclusions of the Constitutional Court on these issues provided legal certainty in law enforcement practice and became an important factor in making changes to the legislation. On September the 1st, some of the amendments uh, were entered into force, which are part of the fifth anti-monopoly package and provide for the exclusion of anti-monopoly immunities for cartels at auctions and uh, establish increased liability for participants in agreements using digital algorithms. The use of digital algorithms in conclusion and implementation of cartel agreements is an aggravating circumstance in case 
such uh, persons are being brought to administrative liability. Currently, the State Duma of Russian Federation is considering the draft federal law on the introduction of uh, fines for obstructing anti-cartel inspections and amending um, amendments to Article 178 of the Criminal Code of the Russian Federation regarding the establishment of criminal liability for uh, colluding as cartels at auctions that can cause significant harm to the budget of the country and uh, hinder re re implementation of important socioeconomic programs of the state. It is important to note that the changes proposed do not affect the procedure of investigating criminal cases and providing cartel agreements. It remains the same. The main purpose of these changes is to prevent such crimes and offenses. Since awareness of the possibility to be brought to criminal justice and administrative justice and uh, having a looming fine or the actual imprisonment must have a deterrent effect for potential offenders. At our conference, we are planning to discuss a number of issues in many details, such as uh, counteracting cartel practices or anti-monopoly control for m and activities and the uh, compulsory licensing institution. Uh, we value the desire of our participants that represent scientific community, professional community, and expert community for a variety of subject areas in different countries to analyze the issues of anti-monopoly regulation in a comprehensive and methodological manner. You stem from uh, protection of uh, competition. I wish everybody successful work and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maxim. I would like to emphasize here that we've heard about the Constitution a number of times and we heard about the decisions made by the Constitutional Court. Some of the rulings uh, pertaining to large IT companies, and these are the issues we've been discussing a lot at our Skolkova conference anti-monopoly issues and IP, and thanks to our constitution and thanks to a very rigid position of the constitutional court when it comes to interpreting the items of the constitution, even though there is an immunity, we can prevent the issue of monopolization. And I hope that very soon these issues will be reflected in the current legislation. It gives me a pleasure to give the floor now to the uh, head of the board of Skolkova, the host of this event, Igor Drozdov. Igor, please, the floor is now yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks a lot uh, for being able to uh, have a tradition of our own. Anti-monopoly agency comes to Skolkova for the eighth year in a row uh, prior to the New Year Eve, and I hope that it will continue like this, and this conference will be a fruitful one for you. I haven't been researching that topic that well. I mean, the constitutional basics for anti-monopoly legislation, but I, when preparing to this, I looked into Article 8 in the Constitution that protects the competition, and I saw that it neighbors with the Freedom of Economic Activity article. Of course, for um, a casual reader like me, you might think that these interests are in opposition to each other. It seems like the freedom of economic activity uh, provides for the freedom of entrepreneurial activity, which means that an entrepreneur can choose any means of getting to the ends. And uh, if uh, the entrepreneur is uh, rational, of course, it's profit maximization. And competition are the limitations. And it seems like these things are opposed to each other. But this opposition is only uh, a seemingly one. And these two principles add up to each other. They multiply each other because nothing contributes to monopolization as a free competition. I know I'm, it sounds like a joke, but it isn't. Uh, global examples only confirm that fact. And let me give you some of the facts from the high-tech sector. A lot of people are speaking about uh, the microchips and microelectronics, how hard it is for our manufacturers to jump on the bandwagon, speaking that we've lost on the competition game. But this is a problem that not only Russia faces, the overwhelming majority of countries see it. If we look back to 2002, 2003, we'll see 
that uh, 130 nanometers chips that was uh, the technological success back in the time was about 25. Looking at 2022, the amount of countries that uh, produce seven nanometers chips, which is the current level of uh, uh, knowledge, well, TCMC, Intel, and Samsung are the only three that are doing it. And uh, people are saying that soon even some of them will uh, drop out. Also, speaking about AI and speaking about companies that work in the area of generative AI, meaning the AI that, as we learn, can perform a number of functions for a person, for a man. And there are not so many companies that are leaders in this area. It's open AI that's affiliated with Microsoft, there's Google and there's Baidu. But when it comes to generative AI manufacturers or developers, they are less than a dozen, for sure. Moreover, the startups that had appeared recently, they're being acquired. Recently, a deal has been announced, and Entropic was acquired for $4 billion by Amazon. And it becomes clear that the access to the market will be made more and more difficult. Uh, there are lots of barriers to entry. You must have a lot of means, you must have uh, good electricity and power supplies and uh, computer chips, manufacturers, partnerships. Because what generative AI are, uh, developers are currently doing, they're trying to produce their own hardware. So there's some stats and figures. The amount of startups in this sphere is uh, significantly going down because new players, new entities in this market don't really see a potential for themselves. What it means that very soon a freedom of competition leads to the fact that entrepreneurs are not capable of performing their opportunities or, or realizing their opportunities. So freedom leads to non-freedom. Therefore, I think the protection of competition is the principle that provides for the freedom, that ensures it. It's not the freedom for, it's the freedom against something. It's against others being able to, well, ban you from doing something. Of course, freedom in the technological sphere or entrepreneurial freedom in the technological sphere is the most important one in the world. Well, in Russia, that part or that industry is not yet uh, on a par, but um, we're still doing our baby steps. If we look at the global uh, sphere, and excuse me for my figures being uh, vague and fuzzy, but it seems like 90% of all the companies' capitalizations in this sphere, or the amount of value they generate, it's the technologies or the processes they have. If you look at top 10, that list changes. Only two companies, there's Berkshire Capital and Warren Buffett, and some others, they just uh, come and go. They're like uh, never there for long, you won't find any single oil and gas company, apart from Saudi Aramco maybe, you won't find an oil and gas company in that list of top 10 capitalization by capitalization companies. Of course, that value might be inflated. If you look at the price of share to the profits of an organization, that ratio, just imagine you bought a company and you want to know when it will pay back. If you take Tesla. Uh, it will take you 70 years, NVIDIA 63 years, and ExxonMobil 10 years. That's how much uh, time it will take you to bring your money back. Why is there a gap? Because investors, when investing into those organizations, they don't believe in the future. They're looking at not, of the, at, not at the cash flows that they will find tomorrow, but something that's going to come in the future. Why do they think that Tesla or a chip manufacturer is going to be much better in terms of cash flow to, uh, in the future than today? Because while they're... Uh, building new technologies, there's a possibility for them to expand their sales market, and they can even turn into monopolies. So basically, they preempt or they think that these organizations will soon find a new market niche where there's going to take the biggest share and why nobody will be able to punish them. Well, because the IP Institute will only work for their benefit. Of course, it will not always come true because D-Wave the quantum computer manufacturer that's been around for 20 years, in this amount of time, this company is still loss-making, clearly loss-making. They haven't sold yet anything. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been raised by them, 
and um, major rounds were in 2020 when they entered the market 320 million dollars 13 dollars each share then it went down to 50 cents and i don't know what is their fate right now maybe they've delisted even why because their shares are worth nothing at the moment but it becomes clear that the ip institution like uh, mentioned by my previous speaker plays an important role in building monopolies we spoke about the fifth anti-monopoly package we spoke about digital platforms but every time we speak about intellectual property I don't think it's something intangible or fuzzy um, you shouldn't be thinking that this is all about booking or headhunter or the other digital platforms of this age actually we're talking about quite traditional commodity markets or goods markets because electrical vehicles we can still ride them or on mobile phones we can still use them chips we can still touch them but all of them are based on IP therefore to my mind monopolization in this sphere directly impacts traditional markets and traditional goods and we shouldn't be opposing the two areas like traditional markets where we live as we did in the days of old or the new markets where some new rules need to be invented or coined there are no new rules all those new rules are still about the old things it becomes clear that ip is no longer a tool of uh, creativity it becomes and in turns into an effective tool of competitive combating that helps you to push your competitors away from the market even in your traditional spheres of activity but i'm not here to um, turn a blind eye on that institution it's an institution of also a fair competition because if you invested your money you want your money to be protected and you need to be make sure you need to make sure that whatever you've uh, invested in will be protected on the other hand it's also a way of uh, getting the necessary money for investments I've showed you already how different companies through market exchanges attract or raise capital and the capital comes into that business private investors are needed in it of course and I really hope if in our country the Institute of IPO will take flight especially in the Moscow stock exchange or younger companies will come and join those stock exchanges in some of the cases it can only be possible if uh, IP is there and it's protected it's steadfast but also IP can turn into the, uh, the, the tool for abuse of power and it can also uh, violate the rights of consumers so we're still in for a um, quest to find a balance between the two and i hope that this um, ambiguity will be removed and the immunity idea will be taken out from that because having or not having the immunity doesn't necessarily mean that the anti-monopoly market will completely go bust but there is a balance for us to find and we need to really be sure about where the ip serves good and where it serves evil and i'm pretty sure this is something that we'll be discussing during the plenary session and maybe the discussions we will have will allow you to come closer to finding an answer to that question so i wish all of you a good success and hard work at the conference and do come to us again thank you so very much a month ago There was a council on anti-monopoly policy and we discussed intellectual property as well and immunities of course all our colleagues from other states agree that the immunities do not provide protection for ip they are not given any additional incentives for that this is a vehicle to control the market that's pretty much the only purpose for the immunities and an interesting example came from Armenia. They scrapped all immunities in 2021, and nothing has changed since. This is a evidence of lack of protection there. Well, we have this in our constitution anyway, but uh, so let me give the floor to director of the Competition Law and Policy Center of BRICS, Mr. Ivanov. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moderator, thank you, colleagues. Let me kindly ask you to put up my slides now. Thank you. 
It's been mentioned several times now to set the agenda that we are marking a 30-year milestone of the Constitution, so let me speculate about this a bit. I'd like to congratulate you, first, because in the history of our country and people, it's probably the first foundational text that is so human-centric. The person at the center of uh, governance and society is uh, unique for this area because for the larger part of our history we used to rely on more abstract narratives or individual leaders like stars, secretary general and so on. The new model, the human-centric model that uh, proclaims the person as the ultimate value is unique for Russia and I'd like to once again congratulate you on this milestone, December 12th, coming close, even if it's not a bank holiday. As for us, and anti-monopoly practice and legislation, this pivot has been of critical importance, because where Constitution makes this transition from plan and command economy and society to the new human-centric model, including for economy, competition comes to the fore. The reason for this is that competition is about interaction between multiple autonomous agents who are all entitled and empowered legally to express their wills and pursue their interests. That's the foundation of our civil code. So, unless there are autonomous agents, you cannot have vibrant life. And the article of the Constitution that prevents monopolization is an integral part of this fundamental human right to pursue autonomous economic activities. This two sides dialectic is expressed in research and in our legal doctrine. The chair of our constitutional court, Mr. Zorkin, says as one of his publications that private competition is the modern manifestation of the dialectic principle of the opposite which is the driver for all development. When antitrust uh, was emerging in the U.S., Senator Sherman, who was the contributor to the first clause in this area, put it nicely that this private principle to tap your potential and realize the opportunities should be the foundation of antitrust regulation. So the prohibitions and antitrust law are there to actually enable people and organizations. This is something that makes us different from other advisory agencies where you put up barriers and regulations and enforce them. In antitrust, the very emergent source of regulation is different. It's based on fundamental private rights of people to engage in economic activity autonomously. And autonomy is something that uh, provides the conditions for this melting pot of many actors, inspired by this idea of dialectic development, the anti-monopoly law, which drives development and multi-actor economic systems, has been transformative for social systems in many countries. It resonates with me, and I think it's a very important example for us, for all BRICS countries and uh, the multi-polar, multi-centric world, which is emerging from the past model of development where you had hegemony. South Africa is a very important example on this point. That's what I wanted to say. Nelson Mandela proclaimed competition 
and antitrust principles as foundational, constitutional principles of development. The Constitutional Court recently considered a merger case. Uh, they had two medical clinics. The Court of Appeals rejected the antitrust decision by the regulator. But then the Constitutional Court supported the ban on that merger. That their legal system is not quite like Russia, but they have the right and commented that public authorities, including anti-monopoly authorities, as well as the courts, had to follow the spirit of the Constitution and implement this into their enforcement practices. The ruling is uh, very interesting, it's lengthy, but uh, you could read it if you're interested in the constitutional aspect of antitrust. It speaks in great detail about the spirit of the Constitution in the area of protection of competition and the links between Constitution and antitrust. This idea of development got enshrined into Russian Constitution in Article 75.1, not in the public eye, but it's very important because it uh, continues to evolve this idea of dialectical development, where the opposites generate this force to move forward. It's about sustainability. Sustainable development is uh, not about achieving quantitative targets. It's about comprehensive evolution so that the economy and the society go forward shoulder to shoulder. Our colleague from HSC, a constitutional judge who recently retired, wrote on this a lot, and he believes that this article is one of the pillars for our market economy and antitrust law in particular. This idea is derived from the view of uh, the economy as a complex system. This article is based on Article 18, where the person, their rights and liberties is the foundation for our development and our economy. So this view of the economy as a complex system is something that the government needs to pay attention to, including anti-monopoly regulators. It's always dynamic, it's always in flux, so it's hard to take aim. This is our situation today as a result of social change, change in technology, as well as uh, legal innovation in our law. They've made our economy more human-centric, more dynamic and more flexible. Managing complex systems is uh, a whole science, the theory of complex systems. Might have other names as well, but we have a lot of scholars in this specialization at Colfer as well. Entire labs for this. I think it's a science of the future, or at least of modernity. Complex systems are usually similar. There are a lot of autonomous agents who interact. This creates a sort of chaos. I'm glad to see the granddaughter of Mr. Alexeyev, one of the authors of our constitution, the first chair of the constitutional court in our country, and Mr. Alexeyev, in one of his writings on the legal theory, said that the law is there to give order to chaos, whereby chaos is meant to be a whole host of complex intertwined phenomena. He posits there that freedom of economic activity lays foundation for effective private regulation. He relies on the fractal theory. Apparently, he was a good mathematician as well, and uh, he translates this into 
regulation, I think we can draw inspiration from this to upgrade our anti-monopoly regulations. I think the main challenge for us now as humanity is sustainable development. This is going to be transformative, I believe. And we are pursuing this under SDGs and other avenues. Having set this background, let me now propose a couple of steps to make antitrust law great again, or to align it with the constitutional principles more based on Article 34. I think we've diverged from them a bit, so my humble opinion is to undertake three steps. It's a bit speculative, it's up for discussion, it's a backup and envelope program, but as we are celebrating the three decades of Russian constitution, it's uh, an apt moment to think ahead. So let me take two more minutes to speak about reconstitutionalization of competition law, how to align it back with the constitution as with the requirements, actually, constitutional requirements of Article 34, which posits the freedoms and liberties of the person. The header seems to be garbled. That's not chat GPT. Usually it gives you human readable output. Well, can, can we reboot this while I'll continue? The weird characters used to say to shed the burden or to shed the chains of the industrial legacy. Our antitrust law and the main federal law in Russia relies on the Chicago School. That's the industrial logic of uh, regulating the market. It assumes that markets are static, something that can be measured, quantified in shares, values, grams, all those specific. This allows you, or allowed you during the industrial age, to take action to course correct. The markets today are more complex, more dynamic, where this static approach no longer works. Yeah, here it is. Antitrust unchained from the industrial legacy. I think that. Uh, the immunities that are applied to ID could have emerged exclusively in this obsolete logic of industrial economy. And I think we got bogged down in quantification of market power. It's a bit of a fetish now. For example, shares, specific thresholds, 35, 50, 80 percent, whatever figure take. It's arbitrary. It's a fetish from the Chicago School, which actually worked to relax antitrust in the U.S., to ossify it, and I think that these are constraints on regulation that actually prevent us from implementing the spirit of the Constitution and the antitrust law. The same applies to the regulator, the antitrust authority. The view here is that it's a supervisory body as well as enforcement body. Whereas most regulators uh, have a lot of their own discretion in prioritization. So if we are to enable a structural transformation in our economy and society, then this prioritization of your response is very important. You're always limited and resorted. Staff, time, so prioritization is very important. But this past paradigm of supervision and enforcement does not allow for this. So regulators should not be sweatshop. I'm not saying that's all bad. We still have some mundane regulation. But in terms of the spirit of a constitution, antitrust regulation should be revamped, including its organization. Then to inject the energy 
of entrepreneurship and uh, antitrust. We rely on Article 34 a lot. And uh, we realize it through antitrust authorities, which is not always the case globally. If you look at the US, where it originally emerged, 90% of cases are actually private lawsuits, the very important tool, which is dormant in Russia. Lipsuits in Russia, based on this law, are very few. There are a couple of public cases, but it's not a common practice. There is one constraint to prevent this. We don't have class action in Russia, stipulated in uh, the legislation, which is a problem because it uh, allows uh, a level playing field between the monopolist and a lot of smaller entities that were harmed by its monopolist activities. Without such an institution as class action, uh, this is almost impossible. And then we need to streamline the procedure for claiming damages, or losses as damages. It's very hard in Russia to actually prove your losses. In other spheres, including IP, which is kind of privileged in Russia as an area of law, you know, they have their own court, unlike antitrust, they have their special procedure for claiming damages. The Constitutional Court has introduced alternative compensation of losses for antitrust, regardless of actual harm. And uh, depending on how you qualify IP violations, you could uh, find this really appealing. I think the same principle can be applied to antitrust. And then there are specialized judge panels in IP. This, uh, again, skewed the balance towards copyright holders. It used to be more balanced, I believe, before these specialized court panels were established. I'm not even speaking about uh, a dedicated court for antitrust cases. At least specialized panels of judges could, uh, could be improved. Usually we have administrative defenses, but this is different from civil action. I think that civil and commercial judge panels began introducing specialized antitrust grounds. I think it's a bit of a hybrid in Russia. We have commissions under a federal and monopoly service. There is the competitive basis. You need to provide proof, but it's done within the regulator, which is again skewed. Once the case is handed over to someone else out of the service, before the plenum used to be a bit worse, but then after the regulator, it goes to the first court, and uh, the principle of competitiveness is not entirely observed because it's assumed that the investigation has been concluded. I think we can borrow from the best or from BRICS, Brazil and South Africa. I'm glad to see a lot of representatives of this country. I adore this jurisdiction where we have specialized antitrust tribunals. Last but not least, antitrust regulators need to be independent. And we have this in Russia, actually. The Central Bank of Russia has authorities in antitrust and uh, they're fully independent. Working together with the Central Bank, FAS, in the economy and in the financial markets, happen to be subordinated in a way, which uh, is in violation of the Constitution, Article 34, which uh, stipulates 
specific mandates. And uh, it's very strict in wording, it's not limiting monopolistic activities. It says that they are prohibited, and this article cannot be amended by the Federal Assembly. It's one of the foundational pillars of the Constitution. And independence of antitrust authorities is the best practice. All BRICS countries, except for China, now have this institutional architecture. I believe that this type of independence can be very beneficial. I understand that speaking as an uh, independent expert, I am not filing an official inquiry or petition, but take it as it is, uh, as the public plea. We worked uh, with OECD in Kazakhstan in 2016, where we pr presented a report on this state of competition, and I introduced one of the recommendations there, including taking antitrust authority out of the executive branch in Kazakhstan. It's now not it's no longer part of the government, which provided a major boost to their development. I wouldn't like for you to take this as a criticism. A lot of important things are being done. And the scope for FIS is very diverse. The supervisory approach is also important. It generates a lot of new meetings and uh, benefits. As always in life, it comes back to balance. We know this from Russian fairy tale, we know this in the form of in and gain, where you need both life and death, a component of each place. And the supervisor activities by FAS to prevent violations is the component of health, which lives in Russian fairy tales provides the shape to the vessel, to the body. But the next step, which is critical, which is to infuse life into this vessel of body so that it becomes an agent who can go forth and procreate. The component of life is very important, and we have a bias towards the former, not the latter. All the restrictions, uh, all the regulations are in place, but I think, it's my deep belief, that antitrust has this imperative to provide an element of life, I think. And I think it's not fully realized in our law, and there is potential or opportunity to realize this constitutional imperative fully. We are ready to contribute to this discussion, and hopefully the next three decades will bring us there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ivanov. Thank you for your concrete proposals as well, as always. It's great to consider them as a follow-up, and a lot of your inputs are being discussed, indeed. They often seem disruptive, but then you find a helpful component in them as well. Unfortunately, our next speaker wasn't able to join us in person. That's that would be Mr. Sultano. And it's good to be with you. Good morning, я приветствую участников восьмой международной научно-практической конференции «Антимонопольная политика, наука, практика, образование». Хочу выразить благодарность организаторам Фонду Сколково, Федеральной антимонопольной службе Российской Федерации и Международному центру конкурентного права и политики БРИКС за организацию мероприятия и возможность выступить с приветственным словом на этой очень важной экспертной площадке в сфере конкуренции. Сегодня мы говорим о конституционных основах развития конкуренции, в том числе на евразийском пространстве. Все страны Евразийской пятерки при получении независимости взяли курс на создание рыночной экономики, а главные ее атрибуты – право на частную собственность и справедливую конкуренцию. В конституциях стран Союза заложены принципы единого экономического пространства, 
поддержки конкуренции, свободы экономической деятельности, равной защиты всех форм собственности. Провозглашая защиту конкуренции и свободу экономической деятельности, евразийские государства предоставляют бизнесу возможность конкурировать между собой. И здоровая конкуренция способствует развитию предпринимательства, но требует всесторонней поддержки на законодательном уровне включая правовые механизмы защиты и привлечения к ответственности за нарушение конкурентной среды. Поэтому именно законодательство является основой поддержания конкуренции и ее защиты. Главным законом, можно сказать, Конституции Евразийского экономического союза является договор о союзе, где определены общие принципы и правила конкуренции, разграниченная компетенция Евразийской экономической комиссии и уполномоченных органов Государств Союза. Согласно договору, комиссия рассматривает заявление о наличии признаков нарушения конкуренции, проводит расследование, возбуждает дела, выносит обязательные для исполнения предпринимателями стран Союза решения, в том числе о применении штрафных санкций. В частности, за последние четыре квартала мы рассмотрели 17 заявлений, провели 10 расследований и завершили 13 дел. За этот период с целью выявления рынков наиболее подверженных ограничению конкуренции с использованием риск-ориентированного подхода, мы проанализировали 28 рынков, в их числе металлургия, химическая промышленность, электроника, строительные материалы, фармацевтика, продовольствие и ряд других. В честном взаимодействии с антимонопольными органами Союза мы реформируем наднациональное законодательство в сфере конкуренции. В этот год внесены поправки в порядке рассмотрения заявлений дел и проведение расследований, заложены новые нормы в методику по штрафам. Прошло одобрение коллегии Евразийской экономической комиссии. До конца года планируется вынесение на принятие Совету и порядка освобождения от ответственности. За последнее время наша копилка пополнилась рядом решений Евразийского суда. Отмечу, что возросло число обращений в суд Союза от участников рынка. Можно сказать, это судебная практика заполняет нерегулированные пробелы в законодательстве и способствует созданию прозрачных условий для бизнеса при применении права Союза. В завершение хотелось бы отметить, что наша совместная работа с национальными органами имеет важную цель – создать максимально прозрачные и понятные правила игры на трансграничных рынках. Без этого я убежден, достичь качественного развития рыночных отношений, а значит и экономик наших стран, Невозможно. Убежден, что предложения и инициативы участников сегодняшней конференции дадут новый и эффективный импульс для нашего дальнейшего взаимодействия. Желаю всем продуктивного дня и интересных дискуссий. Благодарю за внимание. Who is uh, the deputy head of the chair at the Institute of Private Law under the auspices of the president of the Russian Federation? When in 1993 I became a student of law, uh, the uh, workbook that we used was written by Professor Alexeyev. There were not so many others. And uh, he was the first one to introduce me to law. Anna, now the floor is yours. Hello, colleagues. Um, I'm used to speaking on behalf of two areas of uh, research. It's practice and science. I am responsible for a competition in the Bank of Russia, and I'm overseeing that area of our business. But this is something that I would like to step away from. and. Uh, I'll be talking about the economic rights of citizens, the institutes and um, the institutions, I'm sorry, such as uh, freedom of competition, such as freedom of economic activity, such as um, prevention of monopolization and uh, others. When I was getting ready for this event, I read the notes of Sergei Alexeyev and they inspired me. He put them down on the margins of an alternative draft of the Constitution. Yes, he was one of the authors of our main law, but that alternative draft had 332 amendments. Just imagine the number, the sheer number of it. 
how many amendments, so how many notes uh, did he write down? Of course, the central, the core idea of the Constitution was the idea of uh, upholding the rights of people, the rights, the human rights. And he used to say, Mr. Sergei, Mr. Alexeyev, that uh, our Constitution is the Constitution of human rights. But a lot has happened since then. Digital markets, digitalization as such. Our country has undergone a number of changes and there were lots of driving forces that uh, pulled us and pushed us. But today we're still talking about people. We're speaking about humans. And uh, we're also discussing the issue of competition because we want those human beings to exercise their competitional rights because they're consumers, they're participants of the market. There are also future generations that we need to remember when we remember Article 75.1. It's a new article that appeared only recently, three years ago. Every time we mention the word consumer and every time we look at competition with those human eyes, we realize that constitutionally nothing actually changed and human rights remain the same. But changes, though, is the balance of power. What we see today is that we had to balance between the freedom of economic activity and the freedom of um, agreements and contracts and uh, state regulations. And when we look at what uh, state agencies and bodies are doing, like FAS or the central bank, and when we look at what other governmental bodies are doing, we realize that this customer centricity or human centricity seems to be a uh, prevailing a prevalent idea. Therefore, we now have financial literacy courses organized for the public. We now have um, various measures that will help citizens to remain defended and protected if they go through bankruptcy procedures. Again, the issues that we're discussing in here are twofold. You see the amount of bankruptcies we have in Russia has already exceeded 1 million cases. And that is also because our citizens don't really know how the laws of economy work and it also has to do something with uh, illegal and um, bad practices or bad behavior of various businesses in the market when they or banks for example when they offer additional services such as insurance services that are not overtly seen in the contracts, but the human centricity is not novel. Mr. Alexeyev used to say that in the basis of everything, there is uh, legal culture and professionalism. So today, pertaining that idea or that uh, pivot of ours towards human that uh, sits in the heart of the constitution, we shouldn't forget that all Although we remain human-centric or consumer-centric, we still need to make our market participants, our market players more professional. Balancing between these two ideas, balancing between the freedom of economic activity on one hand and the limitations, the bans on the other hand, we shouldn't forget that our vendors or the banking services providers must become more professional we shouldn't make them we shouldn't make the field of play more stringent but we should make sure that they play their role in a decent manner and of course our citizens need to become uh, more professional as well, more literate, because we shouldn't be patriotic here in the government. We shouldn't be doing the less safe fair attitude, and we shouldn't um, be allowing the chaos to settle in, knowing that we've already started climbing out of it. It's a short presentation of mine, knowing that time is short and everybody wants to speak. I'd like to still take a couple of minutes and tell a few words about the actual cases, the legal cases and the practice. Today, um, in court, constitution is being treated as the basics, as the necessary thing to be applied. We now need to treat anti-monopoly law through the lens of constitution. The High Court of Arbitration had already spoken about that in their plenary session uh, ruling. I'm sorry not the High Court of Arbitration, but the High Court. It was a slip of tongue. And uh, in the court proceedings, we now even see references to the Constitution. 
for example, decree number one uh, during the plenary session two, even in those references, they are still subject to interpretation. And we see that by applying Article 8, Article 34 of the Constitution, our courts are deciding on the limits of the liabilities or the power, sorry, of the anti-monopoly body, or they decide whether the bid procedure needs to be compulsory or not. Does it have to be such? Of course, we are still in for a uh, bumpy ride, knowing that uh, there's still a lot of practical things that we need to learn, but the Constitution once again confirmed its relevance. And there's even a new wave uh, of applying Constitution to the anti-monopoly practices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. I'd like to give the floor now to our esteemed and honorary guest, head of uh, commission from Zambia on uh, competition and consumer protection. Mr. Amadou Sissé, please, the floor is now yours, sir. different from then because it's from an African perspective and from a much smaller economy. Um, it's with great pleasure and delight to, that I represent the Gambia Competition and Consumer Protection Commission in this auspicious conference. In the system of constitutionally protected values, competition protection is paramount. This is because the importance of a well-defined and structured competition protection regime cannot be overstated. The 1997 Constitution of the Gambia embodies the laws of the Gambia and the application of all laws of the Gambia must be in tandem with the Constitution. The Constitution guarantees the socio-economic performance of the Gambia by vesting the power on the government to ensure free markets, control inflation, promote economic stability by regulating market performance and the enhancement of trade, trade and regional integration. It is needless to say that all of these aspects of the constitution are in line with the contribution, with, with competition protection and enhancement. <coughs> Excuse me. Over the years, competition protection has been part of the primary areas of concentration of the government of the Gambia. Competition protection has been incorporated in the, in the NDP. We have a national policy document called the NDP and consumer protection is, and competition is paramount. By the way, we have a dual mandate. We have a competition and consumer protection mandate. The application of the Competition Act and Consumer Protection Act all follow the dictates of the constitution. The extent of the application has been a bedrock in positioning the GCCPC as one of the most vibrant Competition authorities in West Africa. Um, my, my voice, sir. Um, what the government of the Gambia has been very supportive of competition and control protection. In fact, um, ECA, as you know, Africa is divided into East, West, North, and South. And we are part of West Africa, which is Gambia, Nigeria, and a few other countries. So we have a competition, we are a REC. Um, enforcement agency called ECA, ECOWAS Regional Competition Authority, and it's in Gambia. So we, we are very keen in that. The application of this clause is, however, not without setbacks. The 1997 Constitution guarantees the rights of individuals to seek redress before the courts for, for the violation of their rights. In line with this principle, the Consumer Protection Tribunal was established. <coughs> Excuse me, I have it very bad call to provide redress to consumers whose claim cannot be resolved by the commission. We have had a couple of cases that were determined by the tribunal over the years, and we've had some setbacks. Um, in fact, we've just lost a case um, two weeks ago. We, re we recently filed a case before the tribunal against supermarkets that were engaged in selling expired foodstuff and importing products into the country, which violated the product labeling standards um, of, the, of the commission. 
For us, we believe that taking this step to, to enforce the law before the courts is for the good of the public. This was the first of this kind that we have embarked on such. Excuse me. <laughs> excuse me, I have a very bad call. I, I, just, I just got here about an hour ago. Um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is we, we've had our setbacks when it comes to enforcement. And most of the setbacks that we, we encounter actually has to do with governments and sector regulators, for example, the central bank, the regulatory authorities like Pura, the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority that regulates the ITC space, ministries. We are, we are empowered by the act to give what we call policy advice to government, but sometimes our advices are not you know, um, adhered to. We can only advise. So we've issued advice in health, tourism, agriculture, in almost all the sectors. But um, our biggest challenge is actually the ICT sector. Because we, 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 every time we, we issue an advice, the regulator seems to go against it. But now we, we, we've grown. We, we are now much wiser. So what we've done is now we work with them. We, for example, um, we work with the procurement authority. We've just developed some guidelines on promoting competition in public procurement. And it seems to be working very well because now they're like, we're not invading their space, but we are working with them. With the ICT regulator, for example, um, we are, we've just developed some guidelines. Um, we we, we um, are redoing our competition policy guidelines for the ICT sector, and we are doing it in tandem with them. Also, we um, we've just passed the um, Data Privacy Act, which we are jointly enforcing with them. Um, with the central bank, what we've done, we've developed some guidelines on how to protect consumers in the financial sector. Again, the regulation is being administered by us and them. So they, they seem to be warming up to, to that approach because what we used to do is before we used to just fight, 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 we go to court, we like. So we, now we, we, we are, we are, as we grow, we are getting wiser. Um, I also want to talk about sustainability because um, we've, we've just had a conference in Gambia hosted by the ACF. And sustainability was one of the themes of the conference. And I, I, I firmly believe that sustainability is important in, in, in promoting competition because without, without, without sustainability, the um, essence of consumer protection and competition is undermined. Um, we are in the process of enacting our major regulations and the application of these regulations is in line with promoting sustainability in the enforcement of competition law and also with the considering requirements of promoting development and unregulated markets. We hope that in years to come, we, our collective efforts will yield meaningful outcomes and sustainability will be entrenched in our laws. I thank you very much for your attention. I, I just got here, I lost my voice, and thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much. The, as you know, winter has arrived a little earlier. In autumn, we wish you all good health. Now I'd like to give the floor to, to our colleague, a member of the Committee on Protection of Competition from the Republic of Armenia, Shoshana Sarkisyan. Shoshana will be speaking over the video conference. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, and thank you very much, Mr. Zalewski. Allow me to express my gratitude for the invitation to take part in this amazing conference and for the opportunity to speak at the plenary session. I'd like to specifically emphasize the importance of events like this that allow us competition authorities as well as representatives of the scientific community to exchange ideas and opinions about the mechanisms of uh, ensuring better protection of competition. The topic of today's conference is extremely important because the cornerstone of any business relations is the constitution that defines the major principles and the trends of regulatory work. In relation to this, let me introduce the constitutional frameworks that we have in Armenia to protect competition. The freedom of competition in Armenia is guaranteed at the level of constitution that was adopted at the referendum 30th of June 1995. The constitutional amendments 
were taken in 2005 and 15. After analyzing historical amendments, what we see is the evolution of guarantees for the freedom of competition and the enhancement of the uh, level of protection. The final reforms we had in 2015 in Armenia, the recent ones, those were aimed at perfecting mechanisms of the rights and freedoms of men and citizens, ensuring better efficiency of governance, as well as the balance of powers. As the result of such reforms, the type of governance was reformed from presidential, we turned into a parliamentary republic. And the cure of parliament was ensured in building specific uh, governmental bodies. These reform had, have reforms had an important significance in protection of competition because the anti-monopoly body uh, received a new level as well as the guarantees and the freedoms of economic activity had been given a push. And in this regard, I'd like to speak specifically on each of those elements of our constitutional system. In 2005, the constitutional text for the first time saw the term of autonomous body entered and some articles of it provided for the following. In order to realize the main freedoms and guarantees of uh, human beings, as well as uh, its main rights, the autonomous bodies might, might be created. The autonomous bodies uh, will be formed uh, from the majority or by the majority vote of the MPs, and they will be vested with an authority to adopt sub laws. These changes for the first time fixed the Committee on Anti-Monopoly Policy as a permanent standing body. Now it's established by the law and the members are appointed by the MPs. Since the concept of autonomous bodies is a new institution, I believe it's only relevant to describe the constitutional context of the autonomous nature of such a body. According to our constitution, these bodies are vested with authorities that um, are characteristic of an execu uh, executive power because they're responsible for realizing the policy of the government. However, the autonomous bodies might also have a specific set of qualities that will stand them out from other bodies of executive power. They're independent. They don't have any reporting bodies, and they can also adopt norms and regulations, and they can also have the right to formulate a policy of their own activity. Out of the features I just listed, the most important one for us in order to protect and guarantee competition is that there is a difference between independency and uh, autonomy. By independency, what we mean is financial independency, independency in uh, performing the authorities and independence in making decisions. Also, the independence of such autonomous bodies relates to the independence of the members of it, meaning that they have national important social prerequisites for its activities. These terms, independency and autonomy, have certain matches as well. For example, being autonomous also means some of the freedoms suggested in the independency, but also being autonomous means that such a body can make his or her own decisions at a specific level without the need to seek for approval from other bodies. Independency means that there is no influence or control on behalf of somebody else. This nature of independency that flows from being autonomous has been reflected in other norms and regulations. For example, the Committee on Protection of Competition is the main body that ensures the freedom of economic activity, ensures free economic competition and natural environment for in good faith competition and entrepreneurships, entrepreneurial activity. This law also provides for organizational, financial, and institutional and functional guarantees of the independence of such committee and its members. For example, the way uh, 
the people are elected in the committee, the authorities being given to them, functional guarantees are described in a separate article, and such functional guarantees uh, provide for the impossibility of being criminally persecuted without the consent of um, the government of Armenia. Material independence is also provided for in this law. So the Constitution ensures the necessary level of uh, autonomy and uh, independency for this committee to perform its duties. Now, moving on to the guarantees of protecting the competition in the main law of our country, they can be uh, found in the first chapter, the basics of the Constitution and uh, Article 2, the main rights and freedoms. The changes to these chapters of the Constitution can only be made by referendum. Uh, Article 1 of the Constitution says that the Republic of Armenia is modern, democratic, and socially legal state. The basics of its economic uh, economics is a market economy that's based on uh, private pro property, freedom of economic activity, freedom of competition, and it is aimed at ensuring the well-being of nation and social uh, fairness and equality. It means that at the heart of Armenia inter alia is the freedom of economic competition and the freedom of economic activity. The guarantee of the freedom of economic activity and economic competition are laid down in the second chapter. And this article states that each and everyone has the right to do economic activity, including entrepreneurial activity. The conditions and the nature of such activity will be set by the law. The limitation of competition can only be provided by the law in order to protect public interests as state monopolies. It is uh, banned to, it is not allowed to abuse monopoly power. And it is also impossible to realize your monopoly uh, position to the detriment of the citizens. Again, it's guaranteed by the constitution. Freedom of competition being the basis of our constitutional uh, order has of great has a great importance for Armenia. The freedom of economic activity is the main principle of a market economy, and it's a necessary prerequisite for building better relations in the country. However, it's not absolute that freedom and has certain limitations. Again, and those limitations are posed by the freedoms. And again, Building a great environment based on these two principles is necessary for well-being. It's the balance between the two ground-breaking uh, principles that our law on protection of competition is aimed at. That law on protection of competition states the name norms and rules of anti-monopoly work in the country. Also, the High Court of the Republic of Armenia fixes some of those features in its decisions and rulings. In the end, I would like to thank you again for hosting such an amazing event. I'd like to wish uh, well productive discussions and uh, good work, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shoshan Sarkisyan. And thanks a lot to your colleagues that we see are taking part in our conference. That meeting, that plenary session of our conference is coming to a close. I'd like to thank all the speakers for their very interesting interventions. And thank you very much for sticking to the schedule allotted, which is, again, extremely important because next up there will be some other interesting events. We will have a BRICS Plus session that will be dedicated to combating cartels. That's the session we will have after lunch. There will also be a session on anti-monopoly deals and M&As. Tomorrow in the morning, we will have a meeting of FAS between and the Commission of Anti-Monopoly Law from the uh, uh, bar of Russia. And uh, there's going to be a BRICS Plus meeting on pharmaceutical markets. Dear colleagues, the plenary session is over. Thank you very much.